Genesis 42, um, I'm going to read the Amplified. We usually read the text before we share. So Genesis 42. Actually, it's... Yeah, Genesis 42. So please, if you can read, please open your Bible. I'm reading the Amplified Version. Now, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? He said, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some grain for us, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that some harm or injury may come to him. So the sons of Israel came to Egypt to buy grain along with the others who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land, and he was the one who sold grain to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he treated them as strangers and spoke harshly to them. He said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams he had about them and said to them, Ye, You are spies. You have come to observe the undefended parts of the land. But they said to him, No, my lord, for your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, you have come to see the undefended parts of the land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Please listen. The youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. In this way you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you back home and let him bring your brother here while the rest of you remain confined so that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you and your story or else by the life of Pharaoh, certainly you are spies. Then Joseph put them all in prison for three days. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go, carry grain for the famine in your households, but bring your youngest brother to me so that your words will be verified and you will not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, Truly, we are guilty regarding our brother Joseph, because we saw the distress and anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. Yet we would not listen. So this distress and anguish has come on us. Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now the accounting for his blood is required. They did not know that Joseph understood, because he spoke to them through an interpreter. He turned away from his brothers and left the room and wept. Then he returned and talked with them and took Simeon from them and bound him in front of them. Then Joseph gave orders that their bags be filled with grain and that every man's money be put back in his sack so that the provisions be given to them for the journey. And this was done for them. They loaded their donkeys with grain and left from there. And at the lodging place, one of them opened his sack to feed his donkey. And he saw his money in the opening of his sack. And he said to his brothers, My money has been returned. Here it is in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they were afraid, and turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? When they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened to them, <coughs> saying, 
The man who is the Lord of the land spoke harshly to us and took us for spies of the land. But we told him, we are honest men, we are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. And the man, the lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, and take grain for your starving households, and go. Bring your youngest brother to me, then I will know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. Then I will return your imprisoned brother back to you, and you may trade and do business in the land. Now, when they emptied their sacks, <coughs> sorry. Now, when they emptied their sacks, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. When they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And you will take Benjamin from me. All these things are working against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, You may put my two sons to death if I do not bring Benjamin back to you. Put him in my care, and I will return him to you. But Jacob said, My son shall not go down to Egypt with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any harm or accident should happen to him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. So, that, so that's the end of the chapter. <clears throat> so by this time, it's been 21 years since Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph was 17 when they sold him into slavery. <clears throat> now, he's 38 years old. So the Bible says there was a famine in all the land. The famine was all over the earth, but there was food in only Egypt. So when people all over the all over the world heard that there was famine, sorry, that there was food in Egypt, they began to travel to Egypt to buy food. So Joseph's brothers who were not in Egypt, who were in the land of Canaan, were also experiencing the famine. So their father sent them to go down to the land of Egypt to buy food so that they don't die of starvation. But he didn't send all the children. You know, he had 12 children. He had lost one or he thought he had lost one. So Joseph was in Egypt. So he had 11 with him. But he sent 10 of them. He didn't send Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin was the last child. Right. So you know that initially Jacob favorite wife was Rachel and Rachel had two children you know he he loved Rachel but he didn't want Leah so he preferred Rachel over Leah <clears throat> Rachel had two children and those children were the last children so you know how usually people like the last born or the last set of children they are the favorites of the family but Rachel's two children were the last two children one was Joseph who was initially his favorite son who he thought was dead then the second one was Benjamin, who was now the last son and who was now his favorite son since he thought Joseph was dead. <laughs> so when he was sending them to buy food, he didn't send Benjamin because he was afraid that something would happen to him on the road. Maybe armed robbers will fall upon him or a wild animal will kill him. So he sent 10 of the brothers, but he didn't send Benjamin. So 10 of them came to Egypt to buy food. The Bible says when they saw Joseph, they bowed down to the earth to them. Remember Joseph's dream, right? The dream that made them sell him into slavery. When he told them his dream about how he saw his brothers bowing down to him, they said, let's sell him into slavery to see whether this dream will come to pass. They said, let's see what will become of his dreams. But the dream came to pass. They saw him. 
they bow down to the earth. And the Bible says they didn't recognize him. So remember that, as like I said, this had been 21 years. When they sold him to slavery, he was 17. He was just a teenager. Now he's almost 40. He's married. He has two children. He's a full-grown man. So they didn't recognize him, but he recognized them because, you know, they were older than him already. He was the last, he was the second to the last at the time. So they were already men. So he recognized them. Another reason they didn't recognize him is he was now dressed like an Egyptian. So first of all, they had, they, Jacob, first of all, Pharaoh had given Joseph a new name. When Joseph, when Pharaoh brought Joseph out of Egypt, out of prison, he gave him an Egyptian name called Zafnat Paniha. So in Egypt, they weren't calling him Joseph. That's a Hebrew name. They were calling him Zafnat Paniha. So when they saw him, the people didn't address him as Joseph. Two, he was now speaking Egyptian. He had been in Egypt for 21 years. So he had learned the language of Egypt. So he was speaking Egyptian. He wasn't speaking Hebrew. Thirdly, he was dressed like an Egyptian. He was dressed like an Egyptian king. He wasn't dressed like a Hebrew. Fourthly, they had shaved his beard. So remember when they brought Joseph out of prison, the Bible says they changed his clothes and they shaved him. If you've seen pictures of pharaohs in anywhere, right, the pharaohs of old, not just pharaohs, ancient Egyptians, they didn't have beards. The Hebrews always kept their beards. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't even trim them. But the Egyptians never had facial hair. If you've ever seen a picture of a pharaoh, his face is clear. So no hair on his chin, no hair on, no hair on his no mustache, absolutely nothing. They, they shaved them completely. So Joseph had been shaved. He looked like an Egyptian, had an Egyptian name, spoke like an Egyptian, and he was the king. So they saw him. They didn't know who he was, but he recognized them. So they bowed down to him, right? Put their faces on the floor, the way you bow to a king. And when he saw them, the Bible says he, speak, he spoke roughly to them. He said, where are you coming from? And they said, we came from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph said, no, you people are spies. You came to spy out the land. And they said, no, we are not spies. We came to buy food. And he said, no, you people are spies. We came to buy out the land, to spy the land. And he said, no, we are not spies. That we came from the land of Canaan, that all of us are the sons of one person, that we are 12. One is dead. That's what they were explaining to Joseph, that initially we are 12. One is dead, the other one is with our father. So Joseph, in order to prove, pretending that he didn't know them, wanted to prove that what they said was true. So what they said was that we are 12, one is dead, one is with our father. So he now said, okay, to let me know that you are no spies and what you are saying is true, all of you will, be, will remain here in prison. One person will go back. That last brother that you said you have, go and bring him. Let me meet him. So when I meet him, I'll be sure that your story is true, that you actually came from the land of Canaan, that all of you are actually brothers, that one of you actually died, and you have a younger brother. So he threw all of them in prison and said only one person should go. So when they got to prison, so all this time, Joseph was speaking with them through an interpreter. So they will speak Hebrew. He will pretend he doesn't understand Hebrew. So an interpreter who is an, maybe an Egyptian that understands Hebrew will now interpret to Joseph what he said in Egyptian. Then Joseph will speak in Egyptian to the interpreter. Then the interpreter will speak to them in Hebrew. So they didn't know that Joseph was even understanding them. So when they, when they threw them in prison, <clears throat> on the third day, Joseph now came to them. Initially, he said, let only one person return home, right? Then when he brings Benjamin, they can now go free. But now he now changed his mind. He now said he will keep only one person in prison. The rest of them can go back, but they must bring Benjamin. So when he said this, they began to, their guilt began to show. So they began speaking to each other and saying that all this is happening to us because we sold Joseph into prison. So they were like, this is, this is coming back to haunt us because when we sold Joseph into prison, to, into slavery, he was begging us. We didn't listen. And now it has come back to haunt us. So Joseph heard them saying this. And when he heard them, he was moved with compassion and he wanted to weep. So, but he could not cry in their presence. So he ran to his room, cried, wept. When he finished, he now came back. So he took only Simeon, the second brother, not the second, the second born after the first born. 
he took him as a slave he told the rest go back to your father and bring benjamin so they kept simeon in prison the rest of them they gave them the grain that they came to buy but joseph ensured that the money they came to use to buy the food was put back into their sack so the sack that you they put the food in the grain their money was put back into that sack but they didn't know so they just thought it was just food but eventually they found out so when they go back to their father of course they have to explain why <laughs> 10 people left only nine came back where is simeon so they now began to explain the whole story to their father how the man they called him the man of course they didn't know he's joseph so the man said that we are spies and we're trying to explain to him we are not spies so we now told him that we have a younger brother he now said that he will keep simeon as a slave or as a prisoner until we go back and bring benjamin and jacob was like never benjamin is going nowhere that's how joseph has died now you want to take benjamin and if anything happens to benjamin he said that i will die of sorrow so in other words, I will cry until I actually die because no, he's an old man, so he's not exaggerating. By this time, he's he's close to he's like 134 years old, so he's an old man. No, he's 129. Sorry, so he's an old man. So when he's saying that if you take Benjamin and anything happens to him and he doesn't come back, I will weep until I die. He's not he's not exaggerating. So he refused to give them Benjamin. Reuben now came and said, "Give me Benjamin. Let me take him to." the man so the man can release simeon and jacob basically refused and like never i'm not giving you my son ruben was even saying if i don't bring him back kill my own two sons but jacob still refused so eventually they all opened their sacks and they all saw their money that they so they thought they used to pay for the food but the money was in their sack and they were all afraid and they were like what is god doing to us so I mean, this story is, this chapter is very satisfying. It's very heartwarming in that we see how Joseph's dreams eventually came to pass. So you know how the Bible says that all things work together for good? For Joseph, all things work together for good. Every single thing the devil threw at him, through his brothers, through Potiphar's wife, everything God allowed eventually worked together for his good. There was nothing they could do. To stop God's plan for Joseph's life. And there's nothing that anybody can do to stop God's plan for your life, too. The Bible says all things work together for good. All things. You know what it means when it says all things. Every single thing. Both the one that was an attack from the devil, both the one that you made a mistake, both the one that you did without praying, both the one that anything you do, when the Bible says all things work together for good. To them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So everything that was thrown at Joseph. So first of all, he, he, he made a mistake. He had a dream. You should not have told his brothers. Because not everything that God shows you that you tell people. He went and told them. Even that worked for his good. Secondly, he lacked discernment. He should have known that even though these people are my brothers, they don't love me. They hate me to hatred. So he lacked discernment. He still worked together for his good. Thirdly, they threw him in prison in, in a pit and sold him to sold him into slavery in Egypt. All this time he would have been praying, God help me, God deliver me. God didn't help him, God didn't deliver him. He worked together for his good. He went all the way into Potiphar's house. He was working, he had gotten promoted. And things were now looking up. So anybody who doesn't understand what this means, please catch the replays. We have been studying it sequentially, so you understand what I mean. So things were now looking better for Joseph. His future was looking bright. All of a sudden, false accusation from Potiphar's wife. Even that worked together for his good. He got to prison, was working, met the butler and the baker. He interpreted their dreams. One forgot him. Uh, left him there for two years even that worked together for his good so it's very encouraging so, so sometimes you go through terrible situations it looks like you just go from bad to worse it looks like your, your prayers are not being answered it looks like god has forsaken you it looks like god's word is no longer true but the bible says all things 
work together for our good. All things means all things. Truly speaking, if you believe it, you will never lose hope. It doesn't matter what happens. Take Joseph for an example. Whatever happened to him, it worked together for his good. So even if you've made mistakes, even if Satan attacked you, even if no matter, the Bible says all things, all things means all things. So eventually, the Bible says, immediately Joseph saw his brothers. He says he remembered the dreams. Ah, So he's, he knew that God is truly faithful. Now this dream I have held on to for this time, 21 years. 21 years of waiting of God for that particular dream of his brothers bowing down to him. 21 whole years of waiting. Eventually, it came to pass. So it's very encouraging. Anyone here who has been waiting on God for something, you've gone through trials, you've gone through situations, you've passed through fire, it looks like it's no longer coming to pass. Don't give up on God. You have to hold on. Joseph held on to God. So even if you've done things you're not supposed to do, <laughs> let's say God warned you or you read something in the Bible and you went and did it and now you are feeling guilty. Don't allow the devil to trip you with guilt. Remember Abraham? He went and lied. He still got the promised land. I'm not encouraging lying. He lied the second time. He still became the father of many nations. So even when we fall into sin, sometimes Satan will come and say, you know, if if only you didn't do this thing, then God would have been faithful to you. It's not true. God knew that you were not going to walk perfectly when he made you the promise so he had already budgeted that you will make some mistakes you will fall you will sin some sins deliberately and you come back and beg so i'm not encouraging that you should be sinning and coming back to beg and taking god for granted but in case know that god is faithful there are people in the bible who were not perfect they made mistakes they fell into sin but god still was faithful to them so joseph's brothers you can see how the iniquity they, they put their hands into by selling Joseph into slavery who had haunted them. Ah, these people would have been tortured. They would have been so tortured. So they sold Joseph into slavery. They got back. They lied to their father. And the Bible says Joseph wept. Sorry, Jacob wept. He was unconsolable. The Bible says his sons and his daughters tried to console him. He refused to be consoled. So he wept and he cried. So when they see their father, an old man, weeping and crying for somebody who he thinks is dead but they knew that he's not dead they sold him into slavery their conscience would have been pricked so if joseph if jacob cried for three months for three months it had been a constant reminder of their guilt when they see benjamin who is joseph you know they are all joseph's half brothers but benjamin is joseph's full brother he's the last born he's also weeping their conscience would have been pricked. When they see all the women of the house weeping, their conscience would have been pricked. And they kept this secret for 21 years. This is enough. Even if God didn't punish them, this one is enough punishment. Wondering, what would, maybe we should not have sold them. Maybe we should have sold. Maybe we should have just kept quiet. Maybe this should not have happened. So that guilt, you can see that they still held it. They are not let go of the guilt. Such that when they came to Egypt and something bad happened to them, they traced it to what they did to joseph so the joseph threatened them and put them in prison they didn't know it was joseph they just thought he's a random stranger when they got to prison they started to say it's because of what we did to joseph this was 21 years ago it was where we now were in 2023 so imagine something happening in 2000 and 21 years ago is what 2002 so somebody did something, committed a sin since 2002. Then something happens in 2023, and he says, it's because of that thing that I did back in 2000. So that's torture. It's torture. So sin brings torture. When you constantly live in sin, <laughs> you know something is wrong, you are just doing it, doing it, then you are going to beg God for forgiveness. When any kind of strange situation happens, Satan will come and tell you because of that thing you did. It's true. And he will use it to torture you. Anytime someone knows something is wrong, you know lying is wrong, you know cheating is wrong, let's say you've been gossiping, backstabbing, and slandering people in your office. Because of you, they've even demoted some people. If any day comes 
where you were supposed to be promoted and you were not promoted do you know that it's Satan will come and tell you that you know that four years ago when your friend was supposed to be promoted you came and slandered him you lied against him and because of you they didn't promote him so now it has come back to haunt you so let's say somebody is a thief he has been stealing from his office stealing from his office change figures if something is one thousand he says two thousand something is one thousand he says two thousand by the time he does that for like five years if amrabas break into his house one day and steal his goods or if he if a fraudster hacks into his account he will not have the boldness to go to god and say god none of my possessions shall be stolen i claim a restoration of everything he will not have that boldness you know why he's a thief he is a thief let's say somebody has been sleeping around in the days of her youth and through the sleeping of around she now has some complications in her womb when it's time to give birth if there is any delay satan will come and tell you that you know if you didn't do all these kind of things when you were young you know even the boldness to go to god and say no 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 it now it will now become a challenge it will become a challenge if you are a consistent liar you lie just talk 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 say things that are not true if one day you go somewhere and someone has told one lie against you that has made your image change your image in the house people now think you are a wicked person and it's a lie you will not have the boldness to now confront it because you just be like how many people have i lied against in my life it's, you now you now say it's karma you will say it's karma so anytime god says don't do something and you keep doing it once any bad situation arises first of all satan will come and use it to accuse you he will take he will seize your peace you'll be so full of guilt number two you will never be able to pray yourself out of that situation because you will say i deserve it you see how joseph brothers for no reason they just went somewhere somebody just falsely accused them see you are spies see we are not spies see which kind of allies is you are spies you are not spies you are spies you are not spies you are spies you are not spies or not, people other people came to buy food they didn't accuse them it's only us the next thing they threw them in prison this kind of thing you should boldly go to god and say god you know what if their conscience was clear they go to god they will quote scriptures they say god the rod of the wicked shall not fall upon the lot of the righteous no sir, no my have a goodly heritage this is not the portion of the lord we have not done anything god deliver us this is the boldness with which they will approach god but because they had sold their brother into slavery when they were now in the, you know they sold their brother to egypt so now they were in egypt and they were now slaves so the thing that they did came back to them they sold their brother into egypt as 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 a slave now they came to egypt they became slaves they were in prison for no reason the same way they sold their brother for no reason them they were in prison for no reason not on a normal day you should have been bold enough to go to god and say god deliver us but because they had committed iniquity they could not pray so when people do things do things god is warning you you keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it once anything happens <laughs> to become a struggle you will not start saying is it karma is it god is this a tax story story before you finish convincing yourself that first of all god is not wicked he has wiped away my sins he has forgiven and even my mistake he has forgiven before you get to that point where you can now boldly pray you would have suffered for long you would have suffered so there are even consequences for sin if people complete continue to do things that god want them not to do eventually it's not even like god to punish them eventually they will open the door for satan to attack them that is just the truth when you god says don't do this you do it don't do it you do it don't do it you do it eventually you sin is satan's dominion once anybody starts to live in sin now give satan authority over your life but apart from that even things that are not satan that are just normal let's even say it's a coincidence you will never be bold enough so the way to have a clear conscience towards man towards god that you can even be bold enough to approach god i'm not saying if you sin don't approach god though. but when you have complete boldness that you can come into god's presence at any time you can claim the promises you can quote the scripture you are not afraid you are not saying maybe it's what i did or what i didn't do or what i did or what i didn't do is to live a life of righteousness the bible says where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty 
There is liberty if you live a righteous life. Sin is bondage. The Bible says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to, you are servants to whom you yield yourselves to. So if you yield yourself to sin, the Bible says you become a slave to sin. The sin may put you in bondage. So if you yield yourself to God, you become a servant of God. So sin has bondage. So, please, I beg you, for your own sake, don't be like Joseph's brothers. God will forgive you, yes. God will not hold it against you. God is not like saying you did this, so I must punish you. You did this, so I must repay you. So God is not doing that, but Satan will eventually come and throw those arrows. He's very stubborn. He doesn't miss those kind of opportunities. So God is not looking for, okay, you did this, I must punish you. But you don't want to give Satan room to accuse you. So Joseph saw his brothers and he decided to test them. So what he's doing is he's testing them. You know that <clears throat> he had not seen them for a while. He's not sure what their character is. So he's trying to test them to see what is in the hearts of these men. right? So when they said that they have a brother, Benjamin, right? He now said, go and bring him. So all this was a test. He also put the money that they, they were supposed to use to buy um, food. He put it back in their sack. So all this was a test. We'll understand him more tomorrow when we read Genesis 43. But he was trying to understand this, my brothers, what is in their hearts now. Is it the same thing that was in their hearts when they sold me into slavery? Or have their hearts begin to begun to change? So when he administered this test, he now began to see that some things had changed. So first of all, they were in prison. And when they were in prison, they started to, he saw that they were now repentant. Or at least there was guilt over what they did to him. Because when they sold him into slavery, the Bible lets us know in this chapter that Joseph begged them. So they threw him in a pit. And Joseph was screaming from the pit, crying, weeping, wailing, and they deafened their ears. They, init they initially even planned to kill him. It was, it was Reuben who suggested that they don't kill him, and Judah who eventually suggested also that they sell him into slavery. So the original plan was to kill him. So they planned to kill him. They stripped him of his robe. They threw him in a pit. He's begging. He's weeping. He's crying. He's shedding tears. He's appealing to them. I'm your blood. I'm your brothers. Don't do this. And they deafened their ears. They strengthened their face. Their conscience was hard. But now, when he threw them into prison, he could now see that something had changed. So now they now knew that we should not have done what we did. And it is wrong. So he had begun to notice that, okay, maybe my brothers are no longer the same way they were when they sold me into slavery. So what Joseph was doing was wisdom. Before, he didn't have wisdom. When he was in his father's house, he just assumed, okay, these guys are my brothers, right? They love me. Let me open myself to them and share my dreams. So with that assumption, he opened himself, he shared his dreams, and they eventually sold him into slavery. So now he has learned that it's not everybody that says they are your brother that you just share your things with. You must test people. You must test them. So, it's not everybody that says they're your brother in Christ that you just draw close. You will be backstabbed many times. And I'm sure some of us have been backstabbed. <laughs> it's not everybody that just comes, speak in tongues, speak English, quote scripture, and I say, okay, this one is my friend. You draw them close. You will be slandered. You will be gossiped. Your story will be everywhere. And you will wonder why People are not behaving like they know Jesus at all. So what we don't do as Christians many times is test people. I'm not saying throw people in prison and tell them to go and bring their brother. But discern spiritually, well, who is this person? You don't just make friends with everybody. You don't just bring everybody close to you. You don't just bring everybody into your close circle. You don't just reveal your life. If you do, do do that without praying, without discernment, eventually you will run into a backstabber. Eventually, you run into somebody who will, who will lie to you, who will pretend to be a friend, and we end up not being a friend. Eventually, you run into someone who will take advantage of you. You run into someone who is quoting scripture that looks like a Christian, but is not a Christian. 
Can we say this? Just they, they the, Jesus' disciples were not just his disciples, they were his friends. He was always with them, he traveled with them, he eats with them, he even met Peter's mother. So they were his friends. But he chose them by discernment. He didn't just say, Well, I like this one, this one is fine, this one we gel, you know, this one we have common interests, this one we are just you know all these funny, funny things we see how we make friends, or oh, we just gel, you know, we just vibe until they backstab you first, then you will know that it's not everybody that you don't make friends by vibing. So he now said. The Bible says he went into a mountain. He prayed all night. So it was by prayer that he selected his disciples, by prayer and discernment. So even the Judas that eventually betrayed him, it was not a mistake because Jesus came to die. He needed to be betrayed. So he deliberately selected Judas, knowing that in future, in future Judas will betray him. So it was not a mistake. So you, you are not Jesus. You don't need to be betrayed. I've heard so many funny, funny stories. People go into business. After two years, the business partner will run away with their money. You hear somebody, oh, my best friend stole my husband, my best friend stole my boyfriend. And I'm like, if you were praying, God didn't warn you that this this your business partner will run away with your money. If you actually prayed before you went into business, God didn't warn you. You don't say, oh, my, my, my best friend slept, slept my husband. I'm like, God didn't show you that this your best friend is a harlot. That one day she will come and do what she's not supposed to do. Is that you were not praying, or God God just felt like allowing you to go through this. You hear other funny, funny stories of oh, some person told us with my friends, finally the person went and did something that they were not supposed to do. And I'm like, Did you pray before you picked this friend? You must pray before you allow people to get to you close to you, or before you draw them close. Because sometimes it's you that draw them. You say, I like this one, I like this. It's not who you like. The world is too evil. The Bible says, <laughs> the world is too evil. It's not who you like. It's who, when you show them to God, God says, the Spirit of God is in this one. Because you never know <laughs> who will become what in future. So some people, they are, they are your close friends today. They become a Ahitophel tomorrow. Ahitophel, you know Ahitophel now? One of David's counselors. People who somebody who was giving David advice, one of his close military men. When it was now time later, when somebody wanted to take David David's throne, Ahitophel changed camp and started to conspire against David. It's by prayer that you will know the Ahitophels in your circle. If you don't pray, you will never know them. So even Judas, people think that, oh, Judas is obvious. Judases are not usually obvious. They are not obvious. So sometimes you pray about somebody, or let's say you don't even pray. Somebody is your friend or your associate, and the Holy Spirit is giving you vibes, checks, vibes, checks. You are just feeling uncomfortable in your spirit around the person. You now ignore the vibe, ignore the check, ignore the warning. And the reason you are ignoring it is, you know you got the warning, no, that this person... Your spirit doesn't agree. But when you check the person physically, the person is praying, the person is speaking in tongues, the person goes to church, the person carries heavy Bible, the person has even lent you money, the person is so nice. So the, the thing is, what you are checking your spirit does not match the physical. So you now say, you just ignore it, just say, well, I don't know, shall let's just be friends. When you check Judas physically, there's nothing wrong with Judas. When you check him physically, Judas is one of the 12 disciples. Initially, he was not following Jesus for money. When Jesus called Judas, Judas was zealous. He didn't follow Jesus for money. In fact, when Jesus called all his disciples, he didn't promise them anything. You know you now, you are following Jesus because you are going to heaven. Jesus didn't tell them, I will send you to heaven. In fact, they didn't even know he was God. They just thought he's a random guy. They didn't know he was the Christ. They didn't know he was the Son of God. So, for Judas, one random guy just showed up. He just said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And Judas left his job to follow somebody he does not know. Somebody he has never met before. He doesn't even know where he's following him to or what they are going to do. Because when he says, make you fishers of men, now you understand it because you've read the New Testament. 
they did not know what Jesus meant. When he said, I will make you fishers of men, they didn't understand it. They didn't know who he was. So when Jesus called for his disciples, they had no idea who he was. They didn't know where they were following him to. They didn't know how long they were going to follow him. But they left their jobs. Even Judas left his job because originally he was zealous. Good Jesus didn't promise them nothing. You know, we, we have many promises in the Bible. We have heaven. We have eternal life. We have peace. We have joy. We have prosperity. We have health. Jesus promised them persecution. <clears throat> These people, what God promised them is that you will suffer with me. He didn't say, follow me, I will take you to heaven. Follow me, I will give you money. Follow me, I will bless you. Follow me, I will multiply your children. There was nothing. Just follow me, I will make you fish out of me. Nothing. And they followed. Judas too followed. So for many years, it's not like Jesus was popular when he called them. You know, he eventually became popular. But when he called them, he wasn't popular. It's not like everybody knew him. It's not like people respected him as a, as a rabbi. He had not done... He was just one strange fellow, son of a carpenter. And Judas followed. So... What, why was Judas following somebody he doesn't know, who wasn't giving him money, who didn't make him promises of heaven? Why was the motivation for following a stranger? Someone just comes to you now, you that you are working. Someone just says, come, follow me. Then you leave your job. Then you follow the person. The person is trekking around America. You are trekking from Chicago to, to Texas, from Texas to Maryland, from Maryland to Tennessee. You are just trekking everywhere, staying in the wilderness, climbing mountains. And this guy, you don't even know where he's going and what he's doing. So why was Judas following Jesus? If not that he was zealous at the beginning. <laughs> you don't know Judas. So the Holy Spirit, we warn you about somebody. You will not check the person physically. And because you don't see anything wrong, you will ignore the warning. The issue with Judas is initially there's nothing wrong. But later, the Bible says Satan entered him. Satan entered him. Initially, nothing wrong was wrong with Judas. When they sent people to go and preach, Judas would go and preach. When he sent them two by two, Judas went. When they cast out demons, Judas cast out demons. So initially, nothing was wrong. But later, the Bible says Satan entered him. So you now, that is prayerlessly running with people that you have not checked. Satan will enter one, and that one will, be, will backstab you. Your eye will open later, and you see, had I known, had I known. So you don't judge your friends by what they are doing now. You say, oh, this person, you don't judge it with your physical eye, because you can't even see anybody physically. You, you, the Bible says, no, now, no, we know man after the flesh. We judge people from the spirit. So if it's not by the spirit of discernment in prayer, you can't even don't bother trying to evaluate anybody. You will be deceived. And when the Holy Spirit begins to give you checks, you don't now close your eyes and now harden your conscience and say, you know what, I can't see anything wrong, so maybe it's my mind. Or you just, you know that it's not even your mind. You know it's not your mind, you know it's the Holy Ghost. But when you check, either there's some advantage you are getting from the person, maybe the person is giving you money or is going to promise you a job or something, you are enjoying the conversation. There's something you are just enjoying, the presence. Of, and the Holy Spirit is warning you, you will be shocked that Judas will betray you. So some people, when God wants them, they now say, wow, this person is prayerful. <laughs> <laughs> the person is a church member. Story, story, story. Or they will not even bother to pray because they met the person in church. <laughs> you don't know anything. So <laughs> let's imagine that you are working with somebody now. The person is the mightiest apostle of God of our time. Is a mighty event evangelist. Mighty. This one is not the joke. Oh. Of everybody on earth, imagine somebody that of everybody on earth, there is nobody that God is using more than this guy. He has one millions of souls, billions self. He's so mighty. The hand of God is upon him. He's a righteous guy. Hmm. He has written books. He has preached messages. He has done sermons. He has won souls. He has cast out demons. He has taken territories. And after you've worked with this guy, for 15 years. Ah! Mighty man of God. Mighty. The Holy Spirit now says. Or he doesn't say. You are just praying one day. You just feel a check in your spirit concerning this guy. Ah! And you're like, what? This mighty apostle that the whole church globally is looking up to? But the check in your spirit is there. But every time you check, this guy is winning souls. And truly speaking, he's winning souls. He's preaching. He's righteous. He's even right. He's He's righteous. And God is warning you, there is a check. There is a check. You just ignore the check. This could have been what happened to 
Uriah in the Bible. The Holy Spirit will warn him, leave David. <laughs> and he says, no, David is anointed. <laughs> He's the anointed of the God of Jacob. He's the sweet psalmist of Israel. Is he not the one that was prophesied that I have found David my servant? Leave David. He said, no, it was prophesied. I have found David my servant in whom my soul will delight. He says, he shall fulfill all my will. A man after my own heart who shall fulfill all my will. Leave David. He says, no, the covenant of God is with him. He says, unless the sun and moon and the covenant of day and night cease, that's where my covenant with David will cease. Leave David. He says, no, even God named Jerusalem the city of David. Leave him. The Holy Spirit is warning you. Say, no, even God named Jerusalem the city of David. Leave him. He said, no, Jesus is called the son of David. Do you know how many prophecies are of David in the Bible? He says, I will exalt him above all the kings of the earth. I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have anointed him with my holy oil. Leave him. He says, no, the seed of the Messiah, he did that until he died. Until David actually killed him, he died. He died until David killed him. David, David, prayer warrior, write out Psalms, love the Lord. Man, he killed this guy. He slept with his wife and killed him. So you now, that God is warning you, you now see your friend. You now ignore. You say, no, 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 this person is too righteous. You will be surprised. You will be very surprised in future. Because you, you are just judging based on what you can see now. God knows who will kill you in future. God knows who will, you know people, they are dating people. God's spirit is warning them. They will deafen their ears until they marry the person and the person beats them and they die. They now come back. Hmm. They now come back and be blaming the Bible. You see, pray now. You say, no, the guy is handsome. He has chest. You will pray. You know, he's speaking in tongues. Pray. He has Mercedes. He has bought me a car. He has, you, you marry him, you now beat you to death. You will be surprised. Pray. You say, no, this person, in fact, I even saw him in a dream. He's my business partner. You know, we just jail. We just vibe until one day the FBI will come and arrest you because they will say, this is your business partner. He's a drug pusher. But because you didn't pray, you didn't know. So we don't use eyes to judge people. Because if you use eyes, you will walk with David. You know, sometimes those people will be warning people. They will be ignoring it. Uriah, this guy should have known something was wrong. He should have known. The warning signs were there. But no, you know that David is anointed. So nothing is wrong. You are on the battlefield. First of all, David didn't go. That's already a red flag. That maybe something has gone wrong with this guy's spiritual life. We went to war. The king who usually goes with us to war, he didn't go. He stayed at home. He stayed at home. Then when we are on the battlefield, he now called me to come back. The battle, we are still fighting. You know how the Holy Spirit will be giving you checks, sending you dreams, warning you, you'll be ignoring it. That's how Uriah 2 was getting many warnings. So you are on the battlefield. We've not finished the battle. Then David called me back. Ha, is it not strange? Is it not strange? The next thing now says, ha, no, go and relax. Go home, sleep with your wife. Wait, what? Go home to where? Am I not a soldier? The Holy Spirit is warning you, giving you tell you'll be ignoring it. No problem. Continue until you die. Continue. So go back. Stay, stay with your wife. Ah, it's strange, but I'm a warrior. The guy refused. The Bible says he went, he slept at the door of David's house. David saw him the next day. He said, why didn't you go and sleep with your wife? The guy was, ah, ah, how can I go and sleep with my, wife, with my wife when everybody is on the battlefield? He says, no, I will not go. So David invited him and threw a feast. Or God, we're in the middle of a battle. Why are we having a feast? What, what are we feast? What are we rejoicing for? He should have known. He, he sat down there. He ate the food. The Bible says David made him drunk. They drank. They ate and drank until Uriah was drunk. But we are supposed to be fighting. Holy Spirit is warning. Your spirit is, is choked. You are feeling uncomfortable. But you know the guy is just handsome. You know I've always wanted a tall dark and handsome. The Holy Spirit is warning you. you. Say no. I've always wanted. I want this kind of spec. Continue, sir. Continue, madam, until you meet a David that will slaughter you in future.